So I'm having this issue in work where obviously for different reasons lads are clocking in a lot earlier than they're meant to. So obviously we're only legally allowed to work 8 till I think 6pm. Um, however, I understand lads have got kids that they've got to drop off and pick up. So some of the lads have been coming in early but then everyone's been coming in early now. But then every time I turn up at the job. So I went the other day and there was lads checked in at 7 and I got there at 8 and they didn't have any keys. So they've checked in at 7 but then couldn't start work till 8 when obviously Ben turned up with the keys. So it's pointless in that sense. And um, you can set a limitation on the app. So the clock in limitation, um, you can clock in up to 15 minutes before the shift, which is fine obviously. And then uh, clocking out after the shift to show their hours are all right. Because otherwise at the minute what they're doing is just coming in, checking in dead early. So that their hours add up to 40 at the end of the week. But not necessarily doing 40 hours of actual work. Or they are doing 40 hours of work. However, what happens is that lads come in at... We've had lads come in at half six and doing work. And then leaving early. And I went yesterday... And I went there at 20 past four and it was only Ben. Everyone else was gone. So I was like, and Ben's obviously going around then having to tidy up, having to lock all the windows, lock all the doors. So when the lads check in early, they just, just drop the tools and run out the door. And, you know, I've had it before where I'm, I'm always the last on the job and I'm the one having to go around, brush up in the street, make sure, you know, we're not going to get sued. It's my insurance, my company name that's getting obviously tarnished if I don't do those things so yeah I need to set a limitation so that they only clock in um, just before the shift not ridiculously before however I have to upgrade the um, subscription we've got and it's another $777 for the year but this also gives us the geolocation tracking so rather than a minute what some of the lads are doing is clocking in um, in the geolocation and clocking out in the geolocation. But what some of them have cottoned on to is that if they just leave it, it clocks them out automatically and it doesn't show the location of where... Well, it does. It shows the location of where they've logged out, but I have to go in and check it. Whereas with this one, um, this will sort of automatically clock them out if they leave the location so again that one is in the next upgrade so we were i was hoping to not have to do this however it's now panning out that you know i have to do this just to be sure and if we're going to take more staff on and do more then this needs to be sort of bulletproof but because we haven't got that many staff i was hoping to leave it for a while but um yeah it looks like we'll have to do that and just take the over the year. Wednesday morning has started with obviously uh, I had a little meeting when I got in with the lads about obviously clocking in and hours and what we need to do and basically the gist of it was that yeah you can clock in at half six and you can do work without making noise and you know it might last you might get a few days before a neighbour complains to me and I've got no leg to stand on because we only went to work in eight till six. And then I said, so if I let you come in at half six, I've got to let someone stay till eight because that's only fair, isn't it? If I'm letting one lad do outside the hours, I've got to let another lad do outside the hours the other way. Um, so, um, I mean, Everyone has commitments and stuff outside of work, however, I just said to the lad, look, we work eight till half four. If there's anything I can do to help you with that, like, you know, realistically, I will. However, you know, um, one of the lads has got another job in a, he does deliveries after work and he wants to come in early so he can get off early to go and do deliveries for his another job so he can save up money to do his house, which is fair enough but in reality none of these none of these things are my none of them are my fault or my issues 
then obviously I'm trying to help people out. But end of the day, you've got to draw the line and go, right, this is work. This is what we need doing. These student jobs need finishing. These jobs need doing. Like, whatever you're doing after work, outside of work, like, we'll try and help you. However, like, that this is this is your job. This is what you're getting paid to do. Everything else, like, you know, we shouldn't be affecting our work so that you can go and do another job. Um, and then, like say, you let one person do it and then you've got to let everyone do it. So it sort of spiral, spirals, which sometimes people don't understand. But I'm sure we'll figure it out. But I said to the lads, we just need to stay within eight till six so that we are doing things properly, health and safety wise, um, building... I can't remember what the, the actual term is, it is the, the 8 or 6 falls under. Um, I'm just at Chestnut picking up some extra timber to get the. Um, oh, I can't talk today. Desks, wardrobes done. So Ben's doing them. Mick is doing the flooring. Blaine's painting. Joe and Tom are doing the door frames. However, I showed them this morning. I came in last night and as I mentioned, uh, Ben was the only one there tidying up, everyone else had gone. Um, and I just went round and there were so many things wrong. I might put a few of them here, I don't know. Um, and I will, because then I'll show you what we're doing today to resolve those issues and how we're gonna, you know, stop them from happening again. Right, let's go and get this stuff. These are some of the issues we have, don't we? When we do come to do electrics, people don't realise that they're in a position for the wardrobes and stuff. So the wardrobe's meant to go on this side. However, by the time we've got the wood and the batten on, that's gonna be the smallest wardrobe in the world. So Ben's gonna move it to this side and then obviously bring the desk across there and that'll be huge then, won't it? And then bed here, coming here. Um, some of the issues I picked up yesterday were, oh, that one's fresh. Um, where's not the one that's fresh? Oh, so I was telling Joe about when he's filling these, I was like, he's filled them, but then he's not filled them enough so that when that dries, he's going to sand it and then that needs filling again, so it's another job. Whereas this one, he he overfilled it and then he's just sanded it today and obviously that's ready for painting now. But uh, we just had an issue with countersinking the screws, so I don't know if you can see there, that one there and obviously here. Yeah. So we need to make sure we countersink them in. And um, we've also had an issue, pass your tape a sec. I'll oh, just film this so I can show. Uh, obviously the doors, 13, 762. 762mm, seven, however, when you put them in the door frame, they have obviously a rebate for the fire ones and you have different systems. So when the smoke alarm's inside the room, you have the brushed ones. You have a smoke alarm either side of the door. Uh, if you have a system where you only have a smoke alarm on the landing, you don't have brushed fire strips, you just have the flat ones because what you want, you want the smoke to go through the door and set the alarm off. But then when the fire gets um, heat, heats them strips up, they expand and obviously block it within this room. But you still want the smoke to go out. We don't want the smoke to go out because we want everything to be contained in the one room because we've got a smoke alarm in the room and outside. But um, the doors are 762, 30 inch. But you've got to allow, obviously you've allowed up to four mil for fire regs for that expansion of the uh, fire strip. Anything more than that and you're basically deeming the door not effective at being, you know, half an hour fireproofing. So we've got these very tight, I don't know if you see that one. 762 exactly. So obviously this door will just about fit, but then what we don't want it to just fit, because what we'd end up doing is having to play in the door and obviously for it to shut on the brushes. So it's okay on these ones now, we're gonna have to play in the door, but the ones going forward, what I said to lads is before they put the arc saves on, get the doors fitted, get the door frame fitted, fit the door, make sure it's perfect. If you've got one bit that's tight or loose, you can tighten or loosen the screws on the door frame. 
to make it fit the door so that we don't have to touch these doors. These are like not getting cleaned or whatever. Okay. Um, so we're going to do that on the next floor now because obviously they've done this floor and they've done the wall tight. However, when they come to fit these now, we'll show you when someone does this door that it won't it won't fit. By the time you put the hinge on that, it just it won't close. You'd have to shave it. Um, um, what else are we on? Yeah, so hopefully, I mean, I still think that's a better way of doing it, do you? Fitting them after, get the floor in, do the door frames after, and then we can adjust the door frames before the arc's gone. So do door frames and door, and then that way we've got perfect millimetres around the door before we foam it and arc it. Yeah, yeah. So I think from go going forward now we will start doing mm -hmm. that, because we do have that issue near enough every house, don't we, with the door frames? doesn't matter who does them, how well we do them, every time we come to fit the door, there's always shaving to do, isn't it? Sure is. I mean, this looks a mess, doesn't it? But my job today is no more call out today. I need to concentrate on getting the fire panel on and the uh, consumer units. So this is the old consumer units, and you can see it's quite low down. And it's not always accessible to people. So if you're like, you know, old age or um, handicapped or, you know, uh, you don't want to be bending down to look at that. So we bring them up now. I think off the top of my head, I think it's 1350 to the switches for that. I'll have to check it, but I think it is. It's 1350 to 1400, I think. Um, that's what height they've got to be. So that's what they say is the height that is, you know, easy reachable. Uh, 1200 for socket, 1200 for switches, the height. 450 for sockets to the bottom. Uh, but for these, obviously we're going to do these to the same height. Uh, fire panel's got to be on show. And again, we need to get a um, board above there with the zones explaining what they are. So we've got four cables, so hope, but one of them's not. So we're missing a cable from here to the board because obviously one of these is going to be, we need to power the board. And then we've got five cables. When we've only got a four zone panel, so not entirely sure why we've got that, unless that just loops. I think that just loops to that call point. So I think maybe someone's forgot to put that on the zone. So that'll go in the same zone as another one, I think. Um, some slight issues when you obviously have um, some of the young lads learning how to do the wiring. So um, we will uh, go into this one and figure it out. So we should have two electric showers. Uh, that's 2.5. That's 2.5. That's 2.5. That's 1.5. That's 1.5. So we should have. Um, two sets of sockets because uh, we've only got AFDD so I'll talk you through the board and how we set it up oh it could be a long video this one uh, but yeah let's get cracking so I'm going to go through now and fit the fire panel we've got a C-Tec 4 zone um, conventional we want the 2 wire one that is let me check, that's right, because the amount of time they get this is the wrong, the wrong board. I'm sure conventional is four wire. Oh, let me check. So one thing I was just checking was the it, it is a two wire system, so this is the new better system. Uh, the old conventional way is the four wire, which we don't use. Uh, when I opened the box and seen the instruction manual said conventional. I just had to call them up then to check that I'm not about to fit the wrong board for the wrong wiring, basically. So when if you fit a, the wrong board, which we, we've done it before, um, cause I've sent the lads to pick a panel up and uh, they've picked a the conventional one up. They look absolutely identical, everything's the same, except when you wire it in, it won't work. <laughs> so um, I'll go through setting this up now. So. The hardest bit is stripping these. So what I'm going to do is strip. I've just run a wire between, obviously, the board and the fire panel. Oh, it's this now. So when I first started, this is um, 
this used to be a nightmare to strip. Well, it still is a nightmare to strip, but obviously what you've got to do is sort of score the outside, then bend it back and forth. Because what it has is a metal, and then obviously you can then pull that out without damaging the um, thing. So what this has got, I don't know if you can see it, it's got like a, a metal sheath around it. See that? That's what obviously makes it fireproof. Well, not fa totally fireproof, but... The idea is that if you have a fire and the fire melts the cable before it allows the signal to the alarm to set it off. So, uh, you can see this is like massively robust compared to your normal twin and earth, which is, you know, nothing compared to that. But yeah, let's get these stripped and then we'll put the board on. So when you first get these, you get this bag and it probably looks a bit daunting at first because it did to me when I first uh, opened it. However, I'll go through each one and what they do. And it comes with a little key to obviously open the, the panel with. 1850. And then what I'm gonna do is, here's the consumer unit that we've got as well. So what I'm gonna do is make sure that they, the switches come out. 1350 so I'm just going to mark the top of that and then what I will do then is I'll leave that for now and I'll just focus on this so if I have that the same height obviously I need my cable to come through the back there so this is where I'm now gonna cut out so I can take this bit off while I do that. So what I can do is disconnect that and leave that there for now. Um, this is the bit we need to get in there now. So I've got a section here that I can cut out with me multi-tool. So let's go ahead and do that. do pull all these cables through so I've pre-stripped them because otherwise it's a nightmare trying to strip them when they're in that and then what we need to do now is at this level with the top of the other one and oh, I keep picking up the wrong screwdriver so what we want to do is at this level with the other one and then level itself and then we'll mark where these screws are going there we go and then we can take that off there's the four screws that we're going to do i think we're into wood there or not <laughs> i think that bit we are and then that one we're not One we are so what was that then two of them <laughs> so what we do is put this on and you'll see as i push this what happens is that opens up and then as you tighten it keep doing it this will open up fully onto the back of the plasterboard, so where my finger is would be the plasterboard and you'd have that fixing then, which all the way around the back you can see like that five star thing is gripping it so that is now a solid fixing rather than just doing one into nothing really
least four fit. So next, we know which one is the power supply from the board. So we take this little cover off. I mean, I'm not sure why they have this, to be honest. I know it's obviously, so the only thing I can think is everything else in here is gonna be 12 volts, whereas this is the only bit that's 230 volts. So that's the only way I think we can do it. So we know that one is the power. So then we need a bit of air sleeve and we can do connect the power supply. So obviously live in there. There we go. And we can put this back on and get the panel back on then as well. So. Uh, the only other bit we've got to put in is the uh, battery cable. So this bag that I was saying was daunting before. Obviously this and the is for the battery. So let's connect this while we've got access to the to the back. So we'll run this behind here and it's even labelled for you and they've even open the screws up ready for you so nice and easy we'll slide them in obviously this one goes on the live the other one goes on the negative like so and then they give you a link wire however i'm going to put this on there but i'm not going to connect it to that because what happens is then we energize this with obviously the, the power that's in these and it'll start, it might start beeping, although it might not without, with, with uh, the board off. But let's get this plugged back in. So, that, and then we can bend these up because they all go in the top bit here. So let's make sure this is all tidy. do then is let's hook uh, well let's try and bend these up out the way actually let's air slip let's air sleeve these first before putting that on because it'll be easier to easier to do to remember to pause this video and I'm doing four and then I'm gonna this is where them little hooks sort of come in it handy because you can sort of hook it on and it'll hold in place whilst you try and get one of these tiny screws on and then I should have a really small Phillips one really but I don't Let's go through this. You've got Z Z1 is zone one, zone two, zone zone three, zone four, sounders. We don't have sounders because we've got sounder bases. So every single smoke alarm in this house has a sounder on and heat alarm. So what we do is that daunting bag we had before, these resistors here. Uh, so all these are is a resistor which tells the board that um, it's either like a fake a fake sounder 
but it obviously just loops the uh, loops the signal. So what we do is we put them in the missing ones where we don't have uh, sanders and circuits. So we put those four in, and that way this resistor allows the board to obviously carry on doing its job without saying there's a fault because if you didn't leave something out how these work is basically if you imagine that it's a it's a circuit and if one of these breaks if there's a fire the smoke alarm basically breaks the connection and that's how the board recognizes that there's obviously a fault or a fire that, that that's going off so if you don't put these in it'll show up as a fire well, it'll show up that the sound is going off when it's not because it's it's picking up that the sound is giving a signal because we haven't got a resistor in so i mean i can't see a reason for them not to touch but obviously it's better to keep them uh, separate so last one and then we'll get into the other bit so if you imagine that the fire alarm system is a complete circuit like a light bulb with a light switch so the light switch is on and let's just say the light switch is the fire alarm so how this will work is the light is always on basically and then when there's a fire the fire alarm uh, the smoke detector or heat detector will trip the switch basically turn the light off and that's what obviously the board recognizes that there's no uh, current in the circuit and that trips obviously the board so the other daunting um bits in this bag are what's called uh i don't know if you can see that it says a uh, eol so that stands for end of line resistor so these are um radials so we've got four zones so let's just say we had one zone that went from here to this call point so let's just call that zone one so we'd wire Zone one, we wire the um, obviously all the earths just go in a uh, where you go together, and then we've got plus and negative. So we put plus and negative zone one, and then obviously the other side of this now is still an open circuit because uh, you can have you know as many detectors on this as you want. However, for that for that zone, bear in mind that. You want it to be detectable. So if you have a hundred detectors on one zone, the fire brigade come in as a fire. They're not. Gonna, they just know it's one of a hundred, which isn't really useful. So the more zones you have, the better. So you can go. You can see here. There's a, all they've done is just not um, uh, solder on the other four um, four zones. So you can get this can go up to an eight zone panel. Um, However, for the student jobs, we could do per bedroom and a zone of a um, thing. However, we just do it into four zones because that's enough. Enough. However, if you say had hundred on this, so let's just say we use this for one example. This that is the end of the line, so it goes from here to there, and in here we'll have obviously connections for it to go to another one. However, if you're not adding another one, all you do is just put an end of line resistor in, and this is basically the end of the line, and it's a resistor which this recognises as being, you know, coming back to um, the board. And if you don't put this in, it'll flag up as a fire because it's a break in the circuit. You haven't joined the positive and negative in in this to make it a circuit. So that is, and then that's it then. That's all the, all the uh, daunting things that come in the bag. In the bag. So what we do is we go round to the end, end the line on each one, and obviously put those resistors in. So now we're going to go ahead and put these zones in. Now they were labelled at some point zone one, two, and three, and four. However, they're not now because we've stripped all the cables back. But all I'm going to do now is I'm going to put all the earths together so i'm going to cut this main earth put it into a way go and add obviously the other well it should be four we've actually got five but it's not the end of the world so 
just going to try and organise this a bit neater. Uh, so if we get those all together, and we'll put all them together in a way you go, as we said. Or even a connector block if I've got a big one. I like using the way you go because you know you've got each one in, in them. But it might be easier in this case to trim that one back and put that into a um, that into a connector block. What I'm doing now is tracing them back and just uh, winding these together so that I know. Uh, can you give Joe an hand with the uh, pallet? Just had a pallet delivery now. Yeah, he's, I think he's pumping it down now, the fella. So, what I'm doing is just checking, obviously, where I've cut the thing back. Maybe I should have done this um, earlier, but I'll just finger these together so that if I ever disconnect them, I don't end up putting the wrong live in the wrong... Um, with the wrong, well, wrong positive with the wrong negative. So now, as you can see before, we should just have four of these, but I think what's happened is we've uh, added this one afterwards. So what I'll have to do is obviously keep that on the same line. We've only got four end of line resistors. So what I'll do is I will joint one of these with the, figure out which one's the ground floor. And um, I can add that to the ground floor, maybe as the end of the line or as the start, probably the start one. So I've actually never took one of these off this style, but actually mix just shows us that you turn it that way and slide it down. So what I'm going to do is, well, a good job I did take this one off because uh, that's obviously snapped off, hasn't it? That might have been when I was pulling the... So, you'll see now what I was talking about in terms of... Let's get rid of that. Obviously, what I want to do is bell this through so I know which one it is. But, you see what I mean about the in and out. So, if this is the last one, we have to put an end line resistor in, obviously, one of these so that it loops around so that the system knows it's not uh, saying there's a fire. But what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to connect these two together for a second. And then what I can do, I can use continuity then to check which one of these cables is. So obviously this will tell us when it's in a loop. So I've joined those two. So one of these should be, which one is the one that goes to that switch, that one. So then all these others shouldn't unless there's a screw through there or something so we know that one goes to there so what i'll do is i'll leave that out for now because i need to now figure a way of getting that into the on the system as a two wire unless i run another cable from there i don't know if i can but yeah or oh, i've got to buy another end line resistor and put it in but i don't know if that might confuse it having to two zones in one zone if that makes sense let's check these others first so uh dead easy plus and minus there you go so there's zone one and then what we'll do is when we put the system up in a bit we will um obviously test the smokes and see which zones which and then we can just swap this around so that it matches the zones on the diagram above so that if the fire brigade come in and see a fire in zone one they're not going to the wrong zone yeah right so what will happen now if i joint this it might spark a little bit 
and it'll come up and it'll say supply issue because we obviously is the supply so it'll beep saying there's a fire um saying there's a supply issue and then look zones one two three four are all coming up with faults sound the status so so battery supply is okay but yeah so that's why we leave these out because you don't want that beeping the whole time and draining the batteries so let's get this cover on and we can come back to this once we we'll come back to this once we've um, gone round and fitted the end of lines to each uh, well to each end of line so next we are going to fit uh, the consumer unit so we've gone for a fuse box on this one and what we've done is obviously new ones now. So it comes fitted with surge protection device, main switch, and then this is a MCB to isolate the surge protection so that you can swap this if it ever goes. So those that don't know what a surge protection is, you have uh, obviously 230 volts coming into your supply. Um, so see there, 230 volts. And obviously this is your incoming supply here. Fuse into the meter, out of the meter, into your consumer unit. So we should have um, what's called a isolation switch to obviously turn that off to the board. So I might obviously see if we can get one of those fitted as well. However, to do that, you'd have to pull the main switch out, which we're not allowed to do. You have to bring Scottish Power, who are the DNO, the distribution network. Uh, I can't remember what the O stands for. Um, but yeah, let's ring them, see if they can come and put a switch on for us so that we can work on this board legally. Um, what I'm going to do is obviously get the new board up and running, uh, sorry, up and on. I mean, test the cables before we obviously turn it live. So what we do is we work out how many uh, ways we're going to need. So uh, we've got fire panel. Obviously, we know that one. We just put it in. So I can tell by just picking this up how thick the cables are, that they are light. So that'll be lights, ground floor, lights upstairs. Uh, I can tell by this one because it's a four core, that this is gonna be the emergency lights. Obviously that's gonna be one of the electric showers, the other electric shower. And then what I've done is I've just put a uh, tape around the rings. So on these ones, uh, we've got obviously a ground floor and kitchen ring, and then we've got a basically the bedrooms upstairs ring and these were labelled however they're really long so what I, what I like to do is I like to cut them back and the idea is that like you cut them back so that like this this should be able to reach each corner of the um, board so that if anything ever changes and someone needs to change the board or for whatever reason sometimes the air far over here sometimes it'll be there it might be it might be anywhere and same with the neutrals so what you don't want to do is cut these too short and you're restricted then to where they can go. You want to try and give yourself as much flexibility. However, it does, you know, we're, we're good. We've got a void at the back here that we can obviously push the excess cable into the back. I just find it hard to keep the boards as neat as you see um, people posting on forums and online. I'll put a picture of some good ones now. And then obviously I'll show you what mine looks like at the end. But it doesn't look as good as them, but it's all safe and tested. And we know that everything's working before we put it on. So, same, same dance, let's obviously cut a hole in the back of this uh, or knock a hole through where we want to pull all these cables through and obviously get it level with the um, fire alarm panel and so that these switches are at 1350 height. So. There you go, there's one. Because what you don't want to do is obviously these are sharp, so you don't want to knock these in and damage the cables. And so the next bit you get in the bag is these rubbers. Now these are always seem to come off <laughs> for me anyway when I do them. But if you're doing this knockout, that is obviously sharp metal steel. So what you need to do is put this on so that as you're pulling 
the cables through you don't you know pull them onto that and damage the insulation those who follow the channel will see how many jobs i go to with damaged insulation all the different reasons and this can be one of them and it's such an easy one to obviously avoid by fitting this properly although i don't know why they don't just give you this right size because obviously it's going to be that big yeah where's the button cutters So, there's one, now, depending on the make, this one's actually quite good, it grips, uh, but uh, depending on the make, I used to glue some of these in, if you did like a British General board, because uh, they come and they, were, they weren't very good, they were always coming off, so, let's, uh, let's split the board up, so when you're doing this, obviously, this bit has the most power obviously this is this is where your, your mains comes in obviously that one next to it and then from here onwards what you want to try and do is split your load so you i normally put the higher ampage air breakers here and work my way down to obviously the lower ones are light so we've got two showers so they will definitely be coming through this side of the board and then next we've got Obviously the socket, so I'd pull them through that side of the board. Although, bear in mind we have got um, half that. No, I'll probably do the showers through there and the rest through this side. Because realistically, we're not going to be getting much more through that side. And then obviously everything else left is light smokes. So you can see why we have that little bit of protection. So what I've got to do now is cut this a bit higher because we want the board to be there. However, the cutouts are set where they're at. So I can hook them and bend that up. Hold that while I cut a bit more of this out. There you go. And what we wanted to do is get that the same height as the uh, smoke detector so it looked good make sure it's level some of them actually come with oh let me straighten this up some of them actually come with a level in them in the boards and then what we want to do is mark the top of that the top of that and then these ones down here and then there should be another one there which is very handily put miles out the way and there you go, same as before, we've got the four screws and we can get the drill and the screws which luckily we have a lime now because the place is a mess Organised chaos and the lads have just gone for lunch and left one toilet blocking the street so this is what this is what I'm working with, what people don't understand. So a woman comes down with a pram and we've had a pallet and we say to them, yeah, we're just going to get it in as quick as we can. But no, they've gone for lunch because that's more important than someone coming and saying, excuse me, you're blocking the path. When we could have just done that. Yeah, for now until we get the wood. Oh. Right, back to it. So, uh, oh, screws. Just add them. There we go. Drill. There we go. And then we can get this back up now. So there we go, solid, level with that one. Right now we can get to stripping these cables. So it's a bit easier with the twin and earth. But so that'll be the smoke alarm one. And then 
right, let's strip all these back. So we've got these at seven, six, six now. So that gives us, what, seven, six, two. So we've got two mil each side for the door frame rounds. Oh, maybe we should have done them bigger. Eh? When you think, what, we'll have one mil of paint and then we'll have the, uh, the brush. So that's why I'm saying, make sure we get, so Joe's gonna make these up, fit one in now, then fit the door to it. And then we can adjust this to the door size then. The only problem is, like obviously, cause you're putting screws in the top there. If we do, if the top is out slightly, you'll just have to obviously take the screws out the side and then bring the door out, take the top off and, and widen it a bit, if you know what I mean. But when we get this measurement, we'll just stick with that for all the other jobs then. Yeah. So, you know, if, if we do it now and it's brushed and we go to close it and the brushes are that tight, we'll know, right, do it a bit bigger. If it's not brushed, we can do it a bit tighter in terms of the, the millimetre gap. But we can only go, what, another four mil past that anyway. Because yeah. four mil around the outside of the door is what we're allowed for fire rigs. Sound? Hey, did, um, it's like a slimline system, that isn't it? Yeah. It's what? Uh, yeah, I just got the back to wall ones, you know, so it hides all the all the pipe work and stuff behind. Um, and then, oh, I forgot what I was going to ask Ben though. Oh, 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 oh. Um, I was going to ask you then. I was hoping when I come up when I seen you, it'd remind me, but I don't think it has. Ah, it's gone. That's going to get better to sing on YouTube, can't it? Right, we are back to another boring episode of me fitting a board. So I've just been out to get uh, some meter tails, so. I've measured that we've got to go from obviously here, loop down, and then obviously connect to. There'll be a new um, switch that'll be installed here. But what we're going to do is install everything this side, and then we will. Um, what's the word? We will test everything dead. Make sure it's all safe before we energize it. So what I've got here is what's called a meter tail gland. So what you've got to, oh, what you've got to understand is that when you fit these, we don't want these meter tails moving about in the boards. So we want them to be fixed. So obviously if we start moving this round, if this connection gets loose here, that's what can start a fire. So if this is um, loose, the only thing stopping turning this off is either 100 amps or obviously the fuse blowing on the thing. So this is one of the most important bits on a job. And I've been to a call out where uh, the main was loose on the actual fuse carrier. So you can see this is what's called double insulation. So I'll show you, obviously this is the main power coming in. So you can see how thick that is. And you've got two of those. Because obviously we don't want anything touching this because this is permanently live. Well, I can see there, I can probably take another few mil off this uh, copper ends and also a bit of bent it with a different length. So let's take. Just hand tighten them in, and then I can tighten this one because we don't want these to move within that. So fuse box give you this connection bit, and then what we can do is lift those up so that nothing is under strain. 
Oh, right. Now, just to get... Hello. Put the wrong one on then. So, I'll pick that up and forth. That's a bit small for the main air. So the main air's got to be 16 mil. And yeah, uh, that's the bonding I've brought to go from the board to the gas here. So, and I've got another bit to do that with. Hopefully I can fit this through the little hole. There we go. And then, I so I'm just connecting the main air. So we want that to see the top there like that. Right, so there's our main air. So what we're going to do is try and get that as far out the way as we can. Ah, so, got the meter tails in. Um, tighten this up. Uh, next will be, obviously, the shower uh, cable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect this and then I'll come and test it all at once. So we've got... RCBOs for this one. Price of them have come right down from when um, they first they used to be quite expensive, and then now they're actually okay and they're a million times better in, in, uh, in my opinion. So what you have in here, you have um, 40 amps for the shower. So you've got protection via cables and also got an RCD built in, so it's two in one. And then I'll show you later the AFDDs we've also got for the um, sockets on this house because it's a HMO. But I've hit a bit of a wall and knackered. So I'm not sure how people do this and keep it so neat and tidy. But basically, this is going to be our number two slot. So, oh, come on. So we need to keep this out of the way. So I'm not too thingy done it being. Sorry, this would be number one slot. So this will be our first RCBO on the. So we'll fit that on and then for the first shower we can push these cables back so this will go into the corresponding earth terminal so that if you do have a busy board and you come in to do some testing or some some work you can just go straight to what it is and so for this one, there we go. So I'm just gonna push them behind and we're gonna go live and neutral the other way. So I'll put a little bend on these and we'll have live into there. So what we wanna do is you wanna have as little uh, copper on show just in case you're touching stuff by accident, so we'll probably take about that off, do you reckon? Um, let's try that again. So, similar to this, look, obviously you want to have zero chance of accidentally touching it if it's on. I say I'm not doing it too tight because I'll be coming back to test this. mill this so we've obviously done a calculation for the size of the cable and you know you do learn that on your courses however everyone just uses an online calculator these days it'll do it for you so as you can tell this now is connected you've got your earth into there your neutral and live and this measures obviously everything flowing between the neutral and live and if there's any difference between these um obviously if it's leaking somewhere else so either through a screw water through a person obviously this will trip but everything else will stay on that's obviously the beauty of 
are CBOs. So next one we've got is this one. Oh, that's a six amp. Where did I put the other? There we go. The other forty amp there. The idea is that when you come to testing, so obviously you'll do a periodic test on this, or if they sold the house, someone might come and send an electrician to do a condition report. You want to make it as easy for you to be able to access these cables and test, obviously, the insulation, the continuity, everything you'll see me doing on the call-outs, really. So now we just repeat that steps for the next ones will be the AFDDs. So these are slightly different. So how the theory of these is that, don't ask me how it does it, but I'm sure someone online will be able to explain it. But where this is different to um, an MCB. So this is an MCB. This only trips if this, uh, obviously what's connected to it, uh, uses the right amount or too much amperage, too much um, power to basically the, the cables can handle and it'll trip off. So the way AFDDs work, oh sorry, RCBOs work, is then they've got overload protection, which is your, protects your cables and they've got electric shock protection which obviously protects us. And then AFDDs. So what can happen is, if there's an overload, this will protect the cable. However, before it protects the cable, if something's plugged in that's got a thinner cable, then let's just say the twin and earth that's um, feeding the socket, so two and a half mil. If you plugged an extension lead in, which will go to one and a half mil, the extension lead will catch fire before the cable, so there's a potential that the extension lead could catch fire uh, or melt and catch fire, and then this will trip, um, which obviously we don't want. So then you've got your RCBOs, which again have the added protection of uh, electric shock protection. However, they also are limited to the fact that if um, if this was to have a fault and you've got, say, sockets plugged in and you plug something in that uses whatever, too much current, or if it's going from, you know, live to elsewhere to earth um, in an outlet, this will trip, but only once, obviously, the current's flown through it. So it's almost too late then, because it could potentially start a fire trip however you've already you've already used the currents which you only need a spark to start a fire and then the fire could be going on this is tripped and the fire is carried on so what um arc fault protection do they'll measure the differences and they'll trip before before it occurs hopefully but I have seen videos on these, whether they work or not is a different matter. So I've, I've been told they are testing it out in HMOs and housing associations um, to obviously see if it's something that does work and that they can implement going forward then. So these are on, we have to use them on the sockets for ring main. So because they're so expensive, we've done this ring main as two two ring mains we've done the ground floor and kitchen and then we've also done um, upstairs however we'd normally do the kitchen on its own but because these are more expensive we've um, obviously opted to just join the kitchen on with the ground floor and both of these will go into this AFDD now So there's one AFDD done. Let's get the other one out. So six amp, let's just check it is. Yep, B6. So we'll undo this and that's when we can start putting the uh, in order of usage. So probably the lights will be next. They'll use more power than say 
the um, emergency lights or fire panel. So I'd probably say fire panel probably last. I'll probably use the least because it reduces it down to 12 volts anyway. Oh, yeah. There we go. Let's get this next set of lights in. So this will go in number six now. Right, well, it's not looking too bad. I could maybe zip tie these together. But, uh, right, so another two left. So this should be number seven now, yeah. And so we go emergency lights next. So, uh, we're not going to use the black on this one. So I'll probably either just bend that back on itself or put it into a way you go so that it's... Because we might end up using it. Let's just say we get a fault and there's a break in the live. We can put a sleeve on that and end up using it. But at the moment, it won't be connected on the first light. So I can probably just uh, either bend that into the cavity and hopefully... It's there then if you do need it. So black is the switch. You have brown is live, uh, grey is neutral on a four core, black is switch live, and obviously earth is earth. So what people do is uh, one of the biggest uh, mistakes is they will get uh, the live uh, the neutral mixed up so they use the black because obviously the old colors used to be black so a lot of people use that and uh, i get a lot of call outs where someone's changed the light and they've been like oh i've seen the gray wire i didn't know what that did some people think it's the earth and plug it in the earth and it trips because obviously it's a neutral right one more oh it's getting trickier to feed this wire through the back so I think if you had a bigger, more populated board, I don't know whether people have run the neutrals first, I don't know. Or fit all the all the RCBOs first. But you know been doing building work fourteen years, not exactly electrics day in, day out, so and then I think I've left a spare on here, but I'll have to check. I do normally try and leave a spare because um, things change and the worst thing you want to do is go to add an SPD and you need two slots and you haven't got a big enough board and you need a whole new board just to add an SPD or something else. So they might bring something new out. What's your reckon of that? Probably one of the tidiest ones I've done. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be there'll be people slagging it off somehow. But four sets of lights. So we've got upstairs, the downstairs, upstairs, um, emergency lights and fire panel. AFDDs are sockets upstairs. So, so it should be first and top floor. Ground floor. Uh, sockets downstairs so and kitchen. There, then, was the lava, the two top floors, or are they just on one ring thing, are they? No, they're not on a ring, on a radial, aren't they? It's just, it's just that lava feed to both of them. Yeah. So you've got downstairs, top floor, bottom floor, ring main, then two showers. Yep. And then. What's that do? No, that's the fire panel. No, that's the fire panel. Do you know what that one is? The surge protection. Hey, you get it. <laughs> now, so it, it, you've got to be able to turn it on and off, haven't you? Still got to have a breaker on it. And then if it goes red, it means that it's took a surge out of your system for you. So you've got to check that. I'm not sure, obviously. I think that baffle me is the thing is, Jeffrey, them two two-way switches. Oh, the uh, testing? Yeah, that's And the two-way? Yeah, 
the two ways the two ways easy one but Matt, Matty's made that difficult because he's done too many wires, wires. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that'll do for now I'm going to put this on and then what we're going to do is um, we need to bring Scottish power out to fit a um, main switch for us to turn this on and off which these are going to so um, and then I think we should have a spare Oh, a couple of spares, boss. So how many spares have we got there? Is that a spare? No. What does that do? I don't know what that does. I think that's just for the stick, isn't it? So we've got two spares, which is good. Like I say, you should always leave space on your board for changes. You know, uh, example is one day they might fit solar panels on here. And they might want to have obviously a switch for that. So it's good that we've got two bits. And you might notice the AFDDs don't have a, a test button. And I'll show you why, because these actually test themselves. So I'll go through that when I go through the testing of the board before we energize it. So before you turn this on, you can't just lash a wire and turn it on. You've got to test the cables to make sure that they're all safe. Oh, do you know what I've just left out as well? Mm. Oh, and the buzz bar. <laughs> so yeah, I did actually forget to put the buzz bar in. So one thing when you're doing this is you've got to make sure that all the terminals are open. Because one thing I've seen on call outs is um, someone's had a bit of work done and they've um, pushed this in behind the... Uh, oh behind the actual bit so it's not it doesn't it doesn't grab it so they've gone like tighten this up and then this has gone behind it and it's just like literally flickering touching so it like comes on and off and like literally about to start a fire again any loose terminals that is what starts a fire so you'll see on this uh, i'll bring it when i come and do it um a torque wrench so it says 2.5 nm so that is the pressure that these need to be um, tightened at. So I'm just obviously tightening them loose because not, it's not getting energised yet. And, oh dear, there's that many of them. And then I'll show you me torque screwdriver and we can set it to 2.5. And these will all be, because you can, you can over tighten these or under tighten them. But we'll go through and check everything obviously before it's all done and obviously it doesn't matter where let's put that lid um it doesn't matter as much now because we're not bringing it but it's good practice somewhere in this box i should have some blank covers because if you imagine anywhere a kid can anything you can imagine can happen and I was when I was younger. I used to think, "Oh yeah, whatever." Like you know what I mean? That's never going to happen. And trust me, like it it does happen. <laughs> so like you might think, "Oh, I'll just leave that gap." Like you know, but the reason you have that is because like that that copper I'm touching there is live. That comes straight from these and doesn't have a doesn't have a turn off button. Hundred amps turns that off. So if you touch that, that will own, you'll die and uh, eventually it'll turn that off or it might not. <laughs> so that is why it's so important to, oh, I need another one. I'm having a stink here today, aren't I? So rather than, um... oh God, I'm literally, you can tell I don't do electrics every single day. Well, new installations every single day because I keep forgetting bits. I need to get another one of these. So these are actually better than um, the blanks that you put on that can fall off. So these ones actually uh, clip in. But I'm not going to be able to do it now to put the bloody buzz bar on. Ah! So annoying, Andy. But um, yeah, I do like fuse box. They've uh, ticked a lot of boxes. So I'm going to have to take all this off 
I'll undo all these, take the buzz bar out, put this on, then put the buzz bar in, but then I've got to put, also put um, another one on because we've got two blanks space. So I need to go and get another one of them and do that. So what I'm going to do is put the box on now and obviously there's no one's going to energise this at the minute, so it's fine. It's not even... It's not even... Um, thingy done, so... Let's clip this. I'm going to put on my notes now tomorrow morning to grab another, another spare. Right, as you can see, fire panel and new consumer unit. Uh, that's too high. So these are 1350 high, that should be maximum 1200. I've just finished the board, well, the fire panel board and the consumer unit at one of the student jobs, and I need to go back tomorrow and test it. I've got a meeting tomorrow at the yard with health and safety officer. Not the officer, sorry, a uh, consultant. Um, but I'm just on the way to a call out now. And it's a good one because it's a returning customer. So it's someone I've given my number to who's been impressed with what we've done. And I've said, look, you know, if you come direct, it's half the price. So I'm still earning the same money. Customer's getting it half the price. and. Sounds like an easy one, but every time I say that, it turns out to be a nightmare, so I'm a bit hesitant to say it.